Michael, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Um, what I really want to do is record something that uh, can be useful for patients. Um, it may not be timeless, um, but I think some of the advice that we'll get from you today will stand the test of time. So where I wanted to start with is this concept that um, the world is facing an epidemic of dementia. The numbers are rising exponentially. Is that true? Is it the whole truth and nothing but the truth? The number of people is rising. It's rising in Australia. It's particularly rising in the Asia-Pacific region because here we have the most rapidly ageing population. So in Australia, for instance, there's about 450,000 people with dementia. The majority of them have Alzheimer's disease. There's an equally large number of people in the prodromal stage, what we might call mild cognitive impairment. So yes, there is a very large number. We need to see dementia as a health challenge, something we can do something about. In fact, data has shown that we've reduced the number of new cases of dementia substantially by about 30 to 40 per cent in Western countries, probably through our better lifestyles, including reduced cigarette smoking, more physical activity, some would say a better diet. Counteracting that, we have increasing obesity and diabetes, but even so, we've already turned the number of new cases of dementia around, but sadly, the number of overall cases of dementia is still rising. So what you're suggesting then is that dementia isn't an inevitable consequence. Essentially, there are things that people can actively do that might stop them getting dementia or maybe delay them getting dementia? Yeah, look, we can probably reduce the risk of dementia, the, the number of people with dementia by about 33% in the whole of our population. And we can work on our own individual risk and we can also work on what we might call population interventions. So at an individual level, yeah. there's things that we can do in our early life, in our midlife and in our later life. So we're going to come back to those, but let's take that idea of, if you like, the, the, the general population, a bit like, I guess, fluorinating the water or adding you know, vitamins to bread. What sort of things should we be looking out for, or is it a government approach? Well, we know how successful Life Be In It was in terms of getting people more physically active. You know, Norm and Life Be In It, I think Philip Adams developed that program uh, way, way back in the 1970s or 80s. And we can do a similar thing with dementia. We've been very successful in Australia with public health measures. We've reduced cigarette smoking, um, and we can do the same with dementia. We can get people to attend to the risk factors. There have been population level interventions already carried out successfully in Finland right. and there's similar interventions in other countries of the world as I speak. So these include what are actually essentially what we need to be doing for ourselves, but actually making sure that this is done at a population level. So more physical activity, right. better diet, reducing cardiovascular risk factors, making sure that we remain mentally active, mentally stimulated. And there's also increasing evidence that we need to remain uh, social, we need to become less socially isolated or avoid becoming socially isolated. And interestingly, some other factors that we can again attend to at a population level include things like reducing hearing loss and better detecting and treating depression. Okay, so this would be a campaign a bit like the old slip, slap, slop, the Be In It uh, live campaign. Going back to something you said, there seems to be about two thirds of the risk of dementia that we haven't yet been able to attack. The biggest risk factors for dementia are older age and our family history, and sadly we can't change those. Right, we're and, born and with older those. age is a success. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we're born with our family history and hopefully we will achieve older age. In fact, of young people born today, 50% will reach the age of 100. And we also know that at, at, on current uh, figures, at 85, about a third to a half of the population have either dementia or the early stages, mild cognitive impairment. So yes, we are living longer, but yes, that also increases our risk of dementia. But it's interesting because a lot of people would say, oh, you know, gosh, you get to 85, a third of people are going to be demented. But what that rather suggests is that dementia is an inevitable consequence of ageing because the other people haven't got it. Correct, and that's what we can do at a population level, at an individual level. We can increase our chances of not being in that group that have dementia. So while we can't change our family history, and whilst we're hoping we will get older as the years go by and have a good healthy life, um, we can look at the uh, factors that I mentioned before. So specifically, at early life, we want to make sure... This is the individual approach. Now. Yeah, but this they can all... what we can do, take some responsibility. 
but they can also be part of a population campaign. Right. For instance, better education. In fact, the biggest, what we call population attributable risk factor for dementia in underdeveloped countries is low uh, amounts of education. Right. So we can do that right now. We can get uh, people in the, the uh, regional countries around Australia better educated. That can be done. Obviously, it's the governments that have to do that. There has to be awareness. This is educating about risks. No, this is education full stop. This is going to school. I'm talking about in, in earlier life. Right. So if we get people up to the age of 15 to attend a minimum of six or seven uh, years of school, uh, and one of the real problems there, of course, is that females tend to be less educated than males in many of these countries. Yep. So if we can get them better educated and also um, make sure that nutrition is good in early life, um, make sure that uh, there's no injury or reduced uh, uh, injuries uh, and other factors that might affect our health in early life, that will probably reduce the risk of dementia. But not such a big issue in Australia where we tend to be well educated and well fed and uh, well uh, looked after in our early life. But perhaps where we can start to be really attentive to our individual risk factors is in middle life. And here's an How old is middle life? Because 40s onwards basically. 40s onwards, okay. So, so here's an important concept. Dementia risk reduction starts in midlife. It doesn't start when we're 60 or 70 and start to become worried about where we left our keys or worried about the fact that our mother's getting dementia. We need to actually start thinking about dementia risk reduction at a much earlier age, in our 40s, 50s and 60s. And that includes making sure that blood pressure is detected, making sure that our hearing is adequate, making sure that we're having a good diet and making sure that we're physically fit. And what's a good diet? Because so many people will tell you, I've got the X diet or the Y diet. What is the right diet? Or what's the data telling us about diet and reducing your risk? So the diet that seems to be hitting most of the uh, runs is what we would call the Mediterranean diet. Right. And I'm not talking about what we get in Italian restaurants here in Australia, right. which tends okay. to be very much cheese and, and carbohydrate, but, right. but something that's high in Le green leafy vegetables and yep. salad greens, something that's high in fruit and nuts, small amounts of meat, small, uh, fairly large amounts of fish, um, not too much oil, but if we do have oil, olive oil, not too much sweet uh, food, uh, desserts uh, and what have you, um, and making sure plenty of grains, legumes, but not excessive amounts of bread, carbohydrates. So what we would think of, uh, if we're aware of it, uh, being eaten in the smaller villages in the Mediterranean countries. Got you. So diet normally goes hand in glove with exercise. So what's the advice regarding exercise? So the NHMRC guidelines for older people are 150 minutes a week of moderate level exercise. But there's increasing evidence that those who are very physically fit, and I'm not talking about marathon running, but somebody who can easily do half an hour of a very brisk walk or half an hour on exercise bike every day, are less likely to develop dementia. And in fact, exercise is probably the biggest factor that we can do in Western countries. Maybe diet, there's some debate there. Maybe about 40% of our individual risk reduction lies in the exercise domain. So it's really important. Now, if a patient says, look, I can't exercise, I, you know, I, I, I've got hip arthritis or uh, I uh, become breathless, well, they need to be made as medically fit as possible. But most people can do the sorts of exercise that achieve moderate levels of fitness. And if we really want to be careful about our dementia risk reduction, maybe we've got a family history, uh, maybe we are already starting to worry about our memory or indeed have some memory loss, we might even try to be more fit than that. And you said start in your 40s, so what's the advice for someone who's in midlife? How much exercise should they be doing? Yeah, again, at least 150 minutes of moderate level of exercise a week and probably six to, five to six days a week. Um, uh, so look, start, start uh, responsibly, maybe speak to your doctor or have a physical educator to get you started if you haven't done it. I'm not saying uh, make a marathon your first uh, far, foray into exercise. Uh, start moderately, but build up. Exercise is not that hard. And uh, no, I didn't start doing any serious exercise until I was 35. And now, I, as you know, I can run good distances whenever I want to. Yeah. And you touched on diet. What about people telling me about um, dietary supplements? Are there any good data out there that would support things that people might want to go out and buy? At the moment, there's nothing in a uh, pill bottle that you can get from your health food shop that's been proven to be of benefit. Right. You do need to have enough uh, vitamins and minerals, but you should be getting them from your diet.
Now, there is some evidence for people in the mild cognitive impairment or prodromal stage of Alzheimer's for one particular dietary supplement or medical food, but for the general population, no, it should be not what you get from the bottle, but what you put on your plate. Okay. And in terms of other uh, risk factors, um, we always talk about, you know, healthy body, healthy mind, but what about exercising the mind? You talked about socialising aspects. What about I guess brain training, is there any role for that? There is, there's some evidence that cognitive training, cognitive stimulation can reduce our risk of cognitive decline. Um, it's better to do something that we're not particularly good at already. Right. So if we're great at uh, crosswords, maybe try something more arithmetical, maybe learn a new language, maybe learn a musical instrument. Do something that's challenging. I had one person who decided that they'd get into building uh, Lego models. They'd never been interested in that before. It's turned out to be a very expensive habit for them. Um, <laughs> but uh, they uh, really find a lot of cognitive stimulation from putting together models, not just the ones that are specified in the packet, but ones they've made up themselves. So effectively, just like the best medicine tastes bad, you have to do the sort of mental games that you don't enjoy doing. But you're more, no, well, you're more likely to, to do it if you do enjoy it. And I'm saying do, do something that you're not good at, but ideally something that you also enjoy. She does, she loves her uh, Lego models and uh, some people will love uh, uh, learning a new language or playing an instrument or what have you. So that's a sort of early and middle life uh, strategies. What about people who are, if you like, hitting that, you know, in their pensionable age, 60s plus, what sort of thing can they target that might improve their risk of reducing or delaying the onset of dementia? So continue on with those factors that we've talked about, and even those early life factors, keep your brain educated, uh, university of three age, uh, oh, university, university of the third age, yeah. etc. So those factors are still important, but additionally, in later life, we need to make sure that we're not smoking, we need to make sure that uh, we don't have too many bad habits like uh, excess alcohol, we need to make sure that we avoid head injury. Again, very important to keep cardiovascular risk factors under control, blood pressure, uh, cholesterol if it's excessive. Um, physical fitness is still an important factor in later life. Uh, social isolation is probably more an issue to attend to in later life than in midlife. Most people in midlife are relatively socially uh, uh, connected, but in later life it's quite easy to become socially uh, uh, isolated and we need to avoid that as much as we possibly can. And are there any other drivers? You know, one thinks about the, if you like, the bedfellows of dementia, mood disorder, sleep disorder. Are there any other things that people need to focus on there? Yeah, again, um, depression is a risk factor for dementia and it tends to be more common in older age. Yep. So it's important to identify and treat de depression as uh, much as we can. Um, there's some evidence, for instance, that depression is associated with elevated cortisol and we know that cortisol elevation is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. In fact, there are some trials at the moment targeting reducing cortisol in those with the early stages of Alzheimer's. Sleep deprivation is also a problem with uh, um, uh, older life and uh, with dementia. So those who sleep less are more likely to develop cognitive decline. We know when we sleep, we're actually clearing the toxic A-beta uh, uh, these are those bad proteins that tangle this is, up in the brain. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We, we're actually more likely to clear that during, well, we do clear that during our sleep, and therefore, if we don't get enough sleep, we don't clear these toxic proteins as well. And what about those people who might reach for a sleeping tablet? Is that going to help with those problems? Look, sleeping tablets are never a favourite of geriatricians such as myself. They have too many side effects and there's no evidence that uh, they increase sleep by more than a few minutes. Um, and also, they uh, may actually deleteriously affect our ability to clear the amyloid. They might give us the wrong sort of sleep. Um, one thing, though, is obstructive sleep apnea, that condition where people might snore but also have periods where they just simply stop breathing for periods overnight. Now, that can be better detected now, and there's evidence that that's a risk factor for cognitive decline. So particularly people with obstructive sleep apnea and cognitive problems, memory problems, they should be seen by the appropriate specialist, and they might need one of those CPAP machines or similar interventions. Michael, I, I've really enjoyed hearing these thoughts. I think it's been very helpful for our patients. The bottom line is that we know that we're all supposed to be doing these things. I guess that what we have to do now is say, look, we have good evidence that these things will actually reduce your risk. So really, you, you don't have any excuses. I think that's the headline story, isn't it? Yeah, and increasingly that evidence, as you say, is becoming good. We can't ignore it. We now know that we can reduce the risk of dementia if we pay attention to these risk factors at a population level, and it's very likely to be also beneficial at an individual level. Michael, thank you so much for spending some time. It's been most appreciated. Thank you, Simon. Pleasure.